Good afternoon and welcome to another exciting edition of the Falkirk Center podcast here at Liberty University, where Christ is king, church is essential, and freedom is everything. And I'm joined this afternoon by Dr. John MacArthur, who needs no introduction, but I'm going to try. He is the pastor teacher of Grace Community Church, and he is also Chancellor Emeritus at the Masters University and Seminary. He is also president and founder of Grace to You. Pastor Johnny Mack, welcome to the Falkirk Center podcast. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. It's a delight to be with you. Well, we're, we're so honored. And uh, uh, the first question I want to ask, because it's really, really important uh, at such a time as this, have you had any Fresca lately? Yeah, there's there's uh, stacks of Fresca piling up in my office. I had no idea when I made that comment how much it would activate people who wanted to do a kind deed. So, yeah, I've got a full, I've got a millennial supply of Fresca. Ah, that's wonderful. I didn't know if there was enough aluminum to go around, but that's that's great. Well, well, the good news might be that there's less beer being produced now that they're having to produce so much fresca for me. <laughs> That's great. It's wonderful. Well, can you give us an update, uh, Pastor, about what's happening currently at Grace Community Church right now? Just an update. Well, the people just started coming back. Um, back in March, well, nearly six months ago, when we heard millions were gonna die, we did what any common sense people would do. We shut down, did live stream. The weeks went by and the weeks went by and, and people began to not believe the narrative that there were gonna be dead bodies in the streets and the medical profession was gonna be overrun and the hospitals overrun with patients. And uh, and they began to move a little around in the, in, in the world and in their spheres. And they realized this was not at all what they had been told. So the live stream was still going on, but they started showing up. They just started coming into the auditorium and first there was a small group and then a larger. And, and eventually one Sunday there were 3000 people. Uh, we hadn't said anything, but they just kept coming back. And uh, then it was 6,000 and I think last Sunday it was 7,000. And we did what we could. We put up a tent so that we could be outside. Then we had seating in the patio with a big video screen. We tried that They they, jammed all that they flowed into the family center and then they filled up the worship center so we haven't told them to come we haven't commanded them to come but they're coming to church and and i think the thing that really altered everything was when they when they realized that the death rate was nothing like what they were going to think it was going to be and we basically are in california it's a 0.02 percent chance of dying from covid and that just did not square with fear. Mm. And the people came back. Um, people keep asking me, are you worried about people dying? Uh, I said, look, I, I, dying for a believer is the best thing that could possibly be uh, occur, but we're not, we're not in the business of you know, desiring that or making that happen. But the bottom line is these are adults. They can decide the risk factor and they, they just don't believe the narrative because mm. It's their experience that they're now mingling a whole lot more than they they were at the beginning, and they're not seeing. We don't know anybody in our church who's had COVID or who's been hospitalized with it. Wow, and and Pastor has uh, the president reached out? Has he responded? Have you had a conversation with him? Yes, as a matter of fact, um, not last Sunday, but the Sunday before, he called me after the Sunday morning service. And uh, he was very gracious and said, um, I just want to thank you for taking a stand. Church is essential. And I'm, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. And then we talked a little bit about why, from certainly a biblical standpoint, Christians could not vote Democratic. Mm. Because there's no way that a Christian can affirm the slaughter of babies Mm. homosexual activity, homosexual marriage, or any kind of gross immorality, no way we could, you know, stand behind a candidate who was affirming transgender behavior, which, of course, is really the reprobate mind of Romans 1. So I, I said, these things aren't even political for us, uh, sir. I said, these things are biblical. These things are laid down by, by the Word of God, and we love God. We desire to honor Him and upholding righteousness in a society is what a church is supposed to do. So 
I said, any real true believer is going to be on your side in this election because it's not just an individual. It's an entire set of policies that Christians cannot in any way affirm. You know, Pastor, I'm so thankful that you mentioned that uh, from a biblical convictional standpoint. We, as you know, we have, there are critics within evangelicalism, conservative evangelicalism, who would like to suggest that the Bible has no prescribed political system, the Bible has no prescribed economic order or system of things, and that the, that all of this voting and whatnot falls under the category of Christian liberty. Literally, I, I know of and I can think of off the top of my head certain groups within um, mainstream conser conservative, put that in, in quotations, but evangelicalism that would want to allow for liberty to dominate in that area and say, well, you know, Christians can vote, pull the lever for a Democrat. Christians can pull a Democrat for a, a, the lever for a Republican. And at the end of the day, single issue, one issue voting or whatever else you put in that category should not dominate uh, the Christian ethic. How would you respond to that? Yeah, that sounds like 25 or 30 years ago mm. when the differences were sociological or economic between, you know, ownership and, and labor. That, that is long gone. Uh, look, let me give you a framework uh, in the way that I think of it. Um, we, have a, we have a world full of fallen people. Um, you have to restrain these fallen people. God knows that. And God basically put into place four restraints. The first restraint is individual. It's the law of God written in the heart. Uh, Romans 2, it's either accusing or excusing. So God has a mechanism in every human being. It's part of being human that triggers guilt when you do something against the law of God written in the heart. Now, this society has literally assaulted the conscience. This society says you should never think badly of yourself. No matter what you do, you're who you are. This is who you are. You ought to be proud of who you are. And the, the, the law that now reigns in our society is an upside-down version of God's law written in the heart. So basically, you create a new immorality and call it morality. You slaughter the conscience. So the individual restraint is gone. We even talk about unconscionable things. The second restraint that God built is the family. And that restraint works through parents who raise their children with discipline and virtue. That is completely devastated. And what you're seeing running loose in the streets are kids who were raised without a family and if in a family without family providing any discipline or any consequences for bad behavior. Mm -hmm. So the family has been devastated. The third thing God ordained is government, and that's the police that carry the sword to punish evildoers and protect those who do good. And you're seeing that completely assaulted and attacked. The, the fourth and the most effective, because it has eternal truth tied to it, is the church. So I'm not at all surprised that you have an assault on the conscience by the Democratic Party where homosexuality, immorality at any kind of level, transgenderism is fine, acceptable behavior, and we ought to make laws to normalize it. I'm not at all surprised that the family is destroyed through divorce and uh, abortion, which is the destruction of the, the very reason for marriage. I'm not surprised that they're screaming to defund the police because that's the next restraint to go. And I, I was just waiting for when they were going to hit the church. Mm. So if that's the Democratic platform, then it is an all-out, massive, comprehensive assault on God mm. and on what God has placed in the world to protect people, to allow for civilization to flourish so that, the, that he can be honored in that civilization because they see him through the law in the heart, through the family, passing righteousness from one generation to the next, through law and order, and through the church, which is the pillar and ground of the truth, salt and light in the world. It doesn't surprise me that every one of these institutions has been, is being completely assaulted and attacked. Mm -hmm. And since the Democratic Party has that attack and assault as their platform, I mean, just think of this. Joe Biden said the other day, he's going to make sure he fills his cabinet with Muslims. 
That is that is as anti-Christian a statement as you could possibly make. That is a blasphemy of the true and living God. So none of this surprises me, but this is not some random thing. You can see this is systematically assaulting all the things that God has placed in the world for humanity to flourish. Yeah. No, no thinking person, no person who wanted any kind of life for anyone in the future could possibly affirm that kind of behavior. And one of the core tenets, and you ref reference uh, Islam, the core tenets in Sharia law, I mean, it's, it's diametrically antithetical, uh, diametrically opposed, antithetical in every way to the U.S. Constitution uh, in terms of freedom and the liberties and liberalities that, uh, that we would enjoy. Um, I want to I wanna shift real quick, and I want to talk about Romans 13. You have gone very publicly uh, it, you know, in the, in the last few weeks, um, in standing in defiance against uh, clearly uh, the governor's, uh, governor's and public health official orders in California, and you've given a clear defense of why that is such. Um, but in Romans 13, and oftentimes in the Christian world, we have um, you know, arguments about when is it appropriate to obey, disobey. Um, I just want to I just want to talk a little bit about Romans 13, and in light of that, is there ever a context in which the a strict, absolute application of Romans 13 um, uh, can be an, uh, abused uh, in the sense that uh, Christians uh, don't give uh, context to Acts 4, Acts chapter 5, or Daniel 6? Um, you know, uh, let me just quick review. The government is instituted by God. Whoever resists government resists God. Government is not for our terror, but for good conduct. It's God's servant for our good and an avenger to carry out God's wrath. Those five kind of key principles are there in Romans 13. But when does that not apply? Well, it, it always applies in a temporal sense of law and order. And when it says that God has ordained government, it doesn't mean that every single leader is the best possible choice because he's in some way a representative of God. That's just not true. The God of this world is Satan, and he's ruling, and his demons are operating his evil system through the entire human uh, sphere. So we're not saying that every ruler is a servant of God. There's a sense in which God allows that. But the point of Romans 13 is government as a reality is essential to restrain sinners. If you don't restrain sinners, then the whole world becomes the Lord of the flies, and everybody is just going to be killing everyone else. Uh, you know, this is what I've been saying about all this, this outrageous behavior riding in the streets. People will do whatever you permit them to do. If the restraints are off, that's what they'll do. So the government that Romans 13 is talking about is a restraining force. That's why they have a weapon in their hands, the sword. And the sword isn't to push you along, it's to, it's to, it's to take your life. And that goes back to Genesis 9, right? Mm -hmm. And that goes back to the words of Jesus who said to Peter, put your sword away. If you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And Jesus affirmed capital punishment. If you go back in the early part of the Old Testament, God ordained capital punishment for all kinds of things, including juvenile delinquency, because he knew the impact this would have on humanity in a very general sense. So government has all the law and order power that God could give it to restrain temporal evil and to protect the people who do good. The problem is when government steps into the realm of the spiritual and begins to tell the church what it can or cannot do. And certainly the founding fathers of the United States got that. Really, for the first time in human history, they got that. Because up until the experiment we call America, all nations had blended their religion with their civic leadership. America was something brand new where the government and what people wanted to do with regard to their belief were completely separated. So even the founders of our nation understood that. That is why the Constitution doesn't give people the right to worship. They already had that. That's an unalienable right from God. The Constitution was designed to protect that right. 
And that's why it's so onerous for, say, the governor of California to shut down churches. And you say, well, wait a minute, he didn't shut you down. You can still go outside. They sent us an order that said this. Anybody who's outside in one of your events who is in the presence of another person who's not a family member for 15 minutes has to be quarantined for 14 days. We've got thousands of people. This is absurd. This is a complete and total shutdown. Yeah. So uh, at that point, we, we said, look, you, you've stepped over the, the line. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And that's all we're saying. Uh, you know, Ryan, I should add this too. All last week, virtually every day, we had the training here, training here for the LA Police Department. We do that all the time. Year after year, we've been partners with them because we're we believe in law and order. We believe they are Romans 13. They're the protectors of those who do good and punishers of those who do evil. And the police have been here with this church for decades since 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 I came 51 years ago. So the city knows how we honor them. State Police Department. We we help uh, feed them. We do barbecues for them. We help feed the people at the jail. Everybody knows that about Grace Church. They know we honor those who are in authority. But what's happened now is something that even confounds the police, because we're being asked to do things that are not law. Right. So who's going to enforce that? Mm -hmm. are, you, are you asking the police to come to this church and shut us down when we haven't broken a law? We have simply violated a mandate that the government gave or the health department randomly decided on that if two children, it said, are within six feet next to each other and they're from different families, they have to be quarantined for two weeks. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is absolutely insane. So. We've, we've done what we could. Some people wear masks, some don't. We have sanitizer. We try. But what happened when we saw people coming back, we didn't mandate it. They just started coming, and they just keep coming and keep coming, and they're filling up every square inch of this place. Uh, that's because they want to be here. They're, they're making the decision that since in California you have a .02 chance to die from COVID, 99.98 pretty good odds to go back to church. Yes, absolutely. And I love the fact that you bring up uh, police because even in the military and uh, with law enforcement, there is such a thing as unlawful orders. And that is uh, an order that might be given by an outranking superior officer that violates the Constitution. And so in the United States, the Constitution is the rule of law, that no one stands above it. Uh, and so even... Even somebody who's a sergeant can't say to a private, hey, uh, open fire on a civilian population. It, it, it's just not lawful. They can't just do that, right? Um, and people can't make up as right. they go along. Um, I, just a couple, of, a couple of more things, and as, as we kind of wrap up, I, I think about um, uh, Johnny Mac, Pastor Johnny Mac, and, and so people know that I'm not disrespecting you. We talked about it off camera. I, I think that's such an endearing <laughs> no, term. I'm honored by it. <laughs> I, I, I think of um, R.C. Sproul. He's a giant in the faith and someone we lost just a couple of years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, what would he be thinking, your old friend, what would he be thinking right now in this particular moment? How do you think he would be responding? Well, I have to say I know how he would be responding because his wife has told me how he would be responding if he were here. Yeah. And uh, she has been a tremendous encouragement to me through this whole thing. I mean, it started with the whole uh, social justice and woke thing. And and I, I knew his heart on all of that. And uh, so, yeah, no, I, I have to honestly say I miss him. I told our congregation Sunday that I remember back in 94, when uh, six of us uh, were locked up in a room down in Florida talking about the gospel over a document called the Evangelicals and Catholics Together. And um, it was Bill Bright and it was um, Chuck Colson and it was J.I. Packer, myself, R.C. Sproul and D. James Kennedy. And I told the people Sunday, I'm the last man standing. Packer died uh, two weeks ago and uh, that, that's a different generation with a completely different perspective. I, I miss R.C. I miss him because he's one of the most engaging 
cherished friends that that I've ever had, and mm -hmm. uh, just a remarkable guy. But but we miss his influence. Uh, but he would he would be there with us because he understood the singularity of the church, and he understood church history mm. probably better than anybody. Oh, yeah. And Amen. because he understood church history so well, he knew that the church throughout its entire duration from the day of Pentecost until today has suffered persecution in one form or another. And we have always honored the martyrs. We have always honored the underground church, the believers who met when it was against the law. Uh, sometimes they met in the open and they paid with their lives, and, and, and it's happening now around the world. Mm. So he understood the history enough of the church to know that the church's willingness to violate government when it invades the territory of the Lordship of Jesus Christ is part of the virtue of the church. That's what the church must do. Mm, amen. I, one final question. This is for the young people. I think of the Gen, Gen Z, the millennials, and even some of the Gen X generation. And this, I'm talking about the church who have lost their way. It's clear from what I'm seeing, pastor, out in the culture, um, there were many that were marching in protest with BLM Inc. Um, and, and joining, uh, you know, in the ranks of, of the, the cultural Marxist movement. Um, but what, what's, what's a word of warning that you would give the younger generations right now that they've got a lot more living to do, they've got, they've got to face this, and they've got to fight it? Uh, what would you say to them? Well, I would say find a church where somebody teaches the Bible. Get out of the smoke and mirrors TED Talk and get to a church where somebody's teaching the Word of God so that you learn how to think biblically. Mm -hmm. Because if you think biblically, you, you wouldn't have anything to do with Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is rabidly pro-LGBTQ, rabidly pro-abortion, and it's full of hate and animosity. If you just want to be really simple about it, if you have not love, you're nothing. Mm -hmm. You're a banging gong. And where is the love? Where, where is the love? And I, I, you know, my question to even these evangelical people who get involved in all this rach, racial animus, what are you doing to your children? Mm. What, what are your little boys and little girls seeing you do? Uh, is that what our Lord Jesus would want to teach those children? Mm. To hate, to feel that you've been mistreated and you need to, you need to get your pound of flesh out of the people who've done this to you. I mean, would the Lord want to teach your children hatred of white people or whiteness or white supremacy or systemic racism? What What are you doing to those children who, generally speaking, will be exponentially what you are 2.0? Mm. What are you giving your children when you're basically driven by um, sort of a hatred toward just an amorphous people group, uh, that, that is the damage that you've done to children that's irreparable. Mm. I, I say this all the time. The, the number one responsibility of every Christian parent is the salvation and sanctification of children. Amen. Leading them to Christ, leading them to Christ and leading them to loving sanctification is your calling. Forget all that's wrong with the world. Think about your children. It's tough enough out there you don't want to raise haters in the church to go along with the haters in the world. This is a disaster. Stop thinking about the politics. Stop thinking about the past, whatever went wrong. I mean, this is the world. Lots goes wrong all the time. And start loving the way our Lord did. Start letting the church show the world that we are full of love, not full of anger and hate. Mm -hmm. And your dear children are the tragedy that are going to grow up in that environment and carry it into the next generation. Amen. Pastor Johnny Mack, thank you so much for joining today. And we really appreciate it. We'd love to have you back on. Thank you for taking this stance in this fight, uh, for what you mean for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and for the church at large. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Ryan.